Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Kate Murray, and um, because I'm 107 years old, I have my notes printed out, um, so I'll be flipping through those. Also, um, I have party favors. If any of anyone is a Fadgy fan, I have Fadgy bookmarks, so you can come and find me later, or I'll put them out somewhere. Um, so um, it's always great to be at No Time to Wait uh, to see new faces and familiar faces and friends. I'm Kate Murray from Fadgy and the Library of Congress, and I'm here to give an update um, about recent work to increase support for FFV1 in what might be considered an unexpected crossing of the streams of FFV1 into MXF. So a, a very short introduction to FAGI. Um, FAGI stands for the U.S. Federal Agency's Digitization Guidelines Initiative. Uh, pardon me, Digital Guidelines Initiative. Digitization was our old name, but we're the U.S. Federal Agency's Digital Guidelines Initiative. We are 20 institutional members, all U.S. federal agencies, and mostly from the cultural her heritage community, the Library of Congress, the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration, the Smithsonian, the National Library of Medicine, are all typical participants, but we also have more technical and scientific folks like NOAA and NASA for some specific projects. FADGI is led by the Library of Congress, but is a cooperative and collaborative group. We have two working groups. Um, one focus on still images, and many of you may be familiar with the star rating system in the technical guidelines for digitizing cultural heritage materials. And that group is led by my colleague, Tom Rieger. Um, and they have a new edition of the star rating guidelines, um, which is recently out for public comment, and I'll have a new final version of that in 2023. Uh, and I lead the audiovisual working group, which focuses on audio, video, and motion picture film. And today we're here to talk about FADGI support for FFV1 and MXF. And you're also getting a little bit of a preview um, on this slide of our accessibility work, which Charles Wholesale and I will talk about on Friday. Um, so I checked my notes, and there's actually a mention of FFV1 in MXF at the very first No Time to Wait in Berlin in 2016. Um, but in all honesty, nobody was asking for that, and we didn't really have a use case. Um, until Yasa at Hilversum in 2019, when Bert Lyons and I did a workshop about Embark the Embark tool, which supports audio, which, pardon me, which audits metadata for DPX and MXF files, and there was a suggestion from the audience that a SMPT mapping of FFV1 to MXF might be helpful. And I'll describe more what I mean about a mapping in a moment, but first I just want to talk about why this pairing is important. So uh, I won't go into the history of SMPT RDD48 today, but to summarize, it's a vendor-neutral subset of the MXF file format for long-term archiving and preservation of moving image and other audiovisual materials. Among other things, RDD48 defines a means for the carriage and labeling of multiple time codes and audio tracks, the handling of captions, subtitles, and time text, which is also super important for the accessibility work. Um, it's a minimal core metadata set and content integrity. Um, and the encodings uh, that uh, were included up until now were uh, JPEG 2000, lossy and lossless, and uncompressed. Um, but the FFV1 mapping is published as SMPT RDD48 Amendment 1, and that was published in 2022, just earlier this year, um, and that's highlighted here in the bold outline. And please note that both of these documents are available free of charge with Creative Commons licenses. Um, this was a very first for SMPT, but Fadgy felt it was really important to do this. Um, I'm going to tempt the gods and play a video for you now. So let's see what happens here. Um, and I apologize in advance for the uh, quality of this video, but I think when you hear the accents, you will appreciate this. So let's see. And this may be just specific to Americans, but, oh, can you guys hear that? Um, so, um, I, I'm a native New Yorker, I was born in Brooklyn, so those accents, like, you know, come home to me, right? We have peanut butter in my chocolate. And when I first want to get together with my family, that's exactly what we all sound like. We all, like, drop our R's and, like, talk like this. Um, but let's see if I can get back to my, um, talk here. Um, so, here we go, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Staying on this page for a minute. Um, so, um, MXF, uh, FFV1 and MXF is uh, it's certainly an unexpected pairing, or, or what Shakespeare might say, strange bedfellows, if we're being classy. But really, it's more like the chocolate in my peanut butter. And it has advantages for multiple communities. 
the MXF and SMPTE community who primarily work with large scale broadcast, media, and entertainment are really not widely aware of FFE1 for the most part. There are of course ex exceptions to this. In the US, for example, there's certainly FFE1 adoption at public broadcasting stations, but the community doesn't have a lot of experience with open source workflows, tends to prefer COTS products, and often doesn't like, often prefers SMPTE rather than IETF or other alternative path standardization. Um, I will mention uh, that there's probably others, but um, Telestream's Vantage obviously does support FFV1, so um, there, there is certainly COTS um, support for it. For the FFV1 and open source communities, MXF is a bit of a legacy product that's too complicated, too cumbersome, and too locked down for their needs. But bringing these two together is helpful for both communities. For the FFV1 folks, the mapping will expand the use of FFV1 to the more commercial world, and for the FFV1 folks, having the SMPTE mapping can add a sense of security and validity for those who still might be cautious about adoption. Will FFV1 and MXF be the next big thing? Honestly, I don't know, but that's really not the point. Our goal here for th with this work was to lower the barrier and to make the SMPTE crowd more aware of FFV1 so that that user base can expand, and for the FFV1 folks, they no, have to lo no longer have to deal with comments about not being SMPTE aware. Um, so here's a blog post we wrote back in June, and I'll just call out a, a quote from Carl Fleischauer and a comment, which every time I wrote a blog post, Carl Fleischauer is the first one to post and say some nice things about it, so which I, I really appreciate that. But um, for, uh, our, for archives who prefer to use SMPTE standards, uh, the widely used, like the widely used MXF wrapper, this makes it possible and quote unquote legal for them to do so, but also embrace the well-respected and reversible lossless IETF FFV1 video compression encoding, and this gives archivists a new and useful option for their preservation planning. So what do I mean by a SMPTE mapping? A mapping is simply just instructions for encoders and decoders to understand how to interpret the video essence content within the file. RDD, R, RDD48 already spells this out, for lossy and lossless JPEG 2000 and uncompressed video in MXF. So RDD amendment, RDD 48 amendment one now spells this out for FFV1 encodings. An essential element here is the universal label or UL, which is a uni unique identifier which describes the expectations and behavior of specific metadata element. SMPTE maintains a metadata registry for these ULs and the Library of Congress is an institutional member of SMPTE and the SMPTE standards community which in part means that we have the magic node 13. And this magic node 13 is the ability to add ULs to the SMPTE registry. We added a lot of ULs for the original RDD48 work for JPEG 2000 and uncompressed, and we were able to capitalize on this to add new ULs for the FFV, for FFV1 on behalf of Fadgie. Um, examples of these, you know, uh, these labels uh, define the video essence as either frame wrap or clip wrap and the version of FFV1, and note the ULs are there on the right side, right on the right side. Um, I, I would like to say, uh, I, I, I see that this would have to be updated for when FFV1 version four is finalized, and I would not be mad if that takes a while because it really took a long time for um, these documents to get through the SMPTE process. It took about 18 months um, just to get this one amendment approved in SMPTE. Um, although these labels are defined within the RDD48 framework, any flavor of MXF, can make use of these ULs to create, validate, or otherwise use the FFV1 encoding within the MXF wrapper. Uh, here are some additional criteria for the sub picture subdescriptors. This is table K4, which adds the FFV1 encoding, and then table K5 spells them out a bit. There are similar tables for other mappings for JPEG 2000 and uncompressed that are already defined in the RDD48 specification. Uh, and finally, this table spells out more details about the subdescriptor elements in cable K5 um, on the previous slide. Um, before I wrap up, I just want to say um, that along with FADGI's ethos of guidelines first and then free open source tools to implement the guidelines, we've added FFE1 and MXF functionality to Embark. Embark, is, which is short for Metadata Embedded for Archival Content, is a free open source application that enables users to audit and correct embedded metadata to comply with FADGI guidelines for DPX or MXF. Embark's available for both Mac and Windows, as well as a CL CLI version, although um, I will say that the source code, um, which is available on GitHub, uh, has not been uh, gone through security review, so that we do not have the latest version of that yet up, up yet, but I expect that to happen in the coming weeks. But otherwise, the other new versions that are out now um, all support FFV1 and MXF. Uh, this is an example 
of uh, the subdescriptor data displayed in Embark for FFV1, and this is, is what was included on table K6 on a previous slide. Um, so these are all the resources that are available on the FAGI site, which is digitizationguidelines.gov. Um, again, everything is free, clearly licensed, and uh, applications are, are open source. Um, one thing I did forget to mention is that we also have a set of FFV1 and MXF sample files for testing. Uh, these uh, files may be imperfect, but if you see something, say something, and we'll certainly fix it. Uh, and we're happy to take comments on, on anything that FAGI does, either the files or Amendment 1 or Embark or all things FAGI. Um, so uh, that's it for me, but before I go, I want to thank the Embark team, which is Bert Lyons from AVP, Dan Fisher and Caroline Shea from Portal Media, and Oliver Morgan from Metaglue. Oliver has certainly helped us uh, get through the SIMTI process, including all the UL registrations and created the sample files. And of course, we'd like to thank all of our FAGI partners and friends. Uh, and feel free to contact me at any point uh, through FAGI or just email me or you can tweet at me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to respond. Um, and many thanks for having me and Fadji here. And it's always a pleasure to come to Note 10 to wait. Thanks, everyone. Kate, may I be the first to congratulate you on this momentous occasion? Oh, wow. Um, yeah. I do hope you coordinate it with Laura so we can have peanut butter and chocolate I uh, snacks at the break. I should have done that. You know. Um, are, they, is, are Reese's peanut butter cups a thing? OK, all right, yeah, so we all know, yeah. Hello, I would like to ask you, uh, you got in good direction with uh, getting uh, well for the uh, MTC v one but do you think that is useful to also standardize FFV1 in TIN A uh, group, like a standard, video codec standard, and uh, MKV as a 31FS group, like uh, container standard. Thank you. Oh, right. So I think the question is, it, would it be useful to uh, have FFV1 defined through SIMPTI as well as IATF? Uh, I don't. So uh, the answer is, I think it's already standard with a. So there's a big discussion um, with some of my other colleagues about standardization with a capital S through SIMPTI, which is a. Um, like peer-reviewed uh, official thing through something else like IETF, also strongly structured and peer-reviewed. Um, and so there is a thought like it, it, an app, uh, something is only standardized if it goes through SIMPTI for uh, video or AES for audio as opposed to some of these alternative paths to standardization. I, I don't think that that's the case. I don't think that there would be additional value added to have this process go through SIMPTI again. I think it's already well standardized through IETF. Everything is public there. Um, I think the standard is well structured. I think it's well defined. Uh, so I, I don't know that there would be a strong value add to have it go through SIMPTI again. I, I think it's fine just where it is. And I think that um, it, it has really been, in some cases, a model for collaboration and cooperation with, in the community because it's been super transparent. So it, it, to participate in the SIMPTI standards community, you have to be a member of the SIMPTI standards community, which has barriers to it, right? You have to be able to pay to participate in that. And a lot of the 31FS stuff happens a little bit behind the scenes, right? I'm a member of 31FS, um, and and you know that that process is 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 slow. It produces quality work, but it's slow moving. It's a little bit cumbersome. So I, I don't know that there would be. I don't see a value for it to go through 31FS to come out as a, as an ST SIMPTI standard. I think the RFC through IETF accomplishes its goals and does it well, and it's, it's a well defined standard. I, I think we should have an award. Uh, no time to wait for the best spitter of acronyms in oh, one yeah. minute. Okay, I think you'd be ranking at the top. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um,